Hello everyone, nice to see you here. It's Lisa Sabaniak from the life like you mean it dot com and I am here to talk about our book for our book club, our first one of 2020. It was Eckhard Tolle's The Power of Now. And this book, I've got to admit, first and foremost, we were supposed to have this book club in December. And I thought when I scheduled it, oh yeah, yeah, it'll be no problem for me to fit in everything that I need to do, including the time to wrap my head around this book, of course. And I just didn't. So my apologies that I had to move this particular book club to this weekend. So thank you very much for everybody who is watching and who will watch on the replay. So don't worry if this is your first book club experience and you haven't actually read the book, that's totally fine. Hopefully you'll get a lot out of today's experience anyway. But if you do want to join the book club, it is completely free. And joining all that really means is that you will be entered into the email sequence, which will give you the notifications that the book club date is set, what book is next, the link to purchase that book if you don't have it already, and then any kind of updates that come up with that. And then once we actually do the book club, like right now, then I download that video and I send it to you via email as well so that you can go back and watch it as many times as you like. So it's totally free, totally worthwhile for you to join. And so if you do, I have included the link in the description if you would like to have a look at that later and go ahead and register. So let's get on with our book club because this is an incredibly powerful book, The Power of Now. And it brings up a lot of really different concepts, different for some people that will be watching this. And maybe something that other people that are watching this or have read the, the book that you've seen before. But for those that have never looked at really how to stay present and the importance of staying present, then this, mo this book really could have blown your mind. So we're gonna unwrap it a little bit today. So what I wanna talk about is the overall idea that Eckhart Tolle brings out about our mind having power over us rather than us being in control of our mind. And that meaning that we are really living unconsciously. We're really kind of going through the day to day, not really aware of the fact that we're living most of our day either in the past or in a future that has not actually happened yet. And that that is actually the root cause of a lot of our pain and anxiety and stress. And how you actually would move from this state of unconsciousness where ego is prevailing to a state of consciousness. So let's tackle it now. So his very first thing that he outlines in the book, and it carries on the theme all the way through, is that we are not our mind, yet our mind is in control of us. We are unconscious. He says it's not that it's so much that we're using our mind wrongly, it's that we're usually not actually using our mind at all, that it's using us. And he calls this a disease, really. He says that we believe that we are our mind. And it's so true, right? He asks a very poignant question, which is, have you been able to find the off button on your mind, right? I do a lot of meditation. And so as such, there's a lot of people that will say to me, I can't do meditation, Lisa, because I can't stop thinking of things. And that's really what he is going on about here is that we tend to think that thinking is the same as being conscious, but it's not. And I'll dive into that in a little bit. So he says, just because you can solve a crossword puzzle or you can build an atom bomb doesn't mean that you're actually using your mind. Just as dogs love to chew bones, the mind loves to get its teeth into problems. And that's why it does crossword puzzles and builds atomic bombs. You actually have no interest in either. And then he says, can you be free of your mind whenever you want to? Have you found the off button that I just mentioned? Right? And he says, the basic mechanics of the unconscious state is this identification that we have with the mind, which creates a whole false self, which is our ego. 
And that's a substitute for your true self being rooted in being. And being is with a capital B here. And so this generates a lot of our pain and anxiety, our sense of unfulfillment. And that's what I'd like to talk about next. So the pain, Eckhart Tolle says that the pain that you create now is always from some sort of non-acceptance of what's going on, some form of unconscious resistance to what is. On the level of thought, the resistance is some form of judgment. And how many of us can relate to that, right? On the emotional level, it's some form of negativity. And he says that once this pain body has been activated, right, that pain triggered in us, that it takes over and we want more pain. As crazy as that sounds, our ego thrives off of this. It's always looking for strife. So we become a victim or a perpetrator. Right? We want to inflict pain or we want to suffer pain or both. And this often is seen in a victim identity. Right, And he says that that's the belief that the past is more powerful than the present, which is the opposite of the truth. Right, Most of the people, anybody that I've ever talked to, and including myself when I had a victim mentality, well, I was stuck in the past. That's where the victimhood came from, right? And I was giving so much power over to the past, what had happened, right? And it really is the belief that other people and what they did to us are responsible for who we are now, for our emotional pain, for our inability to be our true self. And I can really relate to that. When reading this book, it's really interesting. This was actually my first read of this book. It, this was not part of my healing journey, reading this particular book 20 years ago when I was healing from 10 years of child abuse. And I was grabbing every book off the shelves, it seemed, but I never was drawn to the power of now. And reading it now, it's really, really impactful because I sit there and see the old self, my old me, and how much I can relate to her through this type of, of wording, right, with the victimhood and how I was looking at things. And it's really interesting to see that even though I didn't read this book then, I made this shift that he is speaking of in this book, and I did it through reading other different books and then just having a shift in perspective myself, right? Taking action on the revelations I was having with other books. And so it's really, it's really transformative for me to read this book and resonate so much with it, but not on a scale of I have to do this, but on a scale of, oh my gosh, this is what I have done, right? And this part, the, I, you know, the belief that other people and what they did to, to me are, are, you know, responsible for who I am today. That's definitely where I was at back then, like 100%, right? And he says that once you've identified with some form of negativity, you just want to, you just don't want to let go. And on a deeply unconscious level, you do not want the positive change. And that's because it would threaten your identity as a depressed angry, or hard done by person. You will then ignore, deny, or sabotage the positive in your life. And I know that those are that's a really hard concept to hear, but I also know that that's exactly where I was 20-some years ago, 100%. I was the hard done by person who had been abused for 10 years to welcome in some sort of positivity and have some sort of shift and want to let go of that negativity and let go of the past meant that I had to let go of that identity I had created for myself and I didn't know who would be left. And that's a very scary thing. So I just see that there's a comment. So let me see. So Tracy says, I'm still stuck. How do you get through this feeling? I am 52 and even more angry than I was as a child. Oh, Tracy, I hear you. And I'm so sorry that you're feeling really stuck. And I hope that as we go through this book, 
at our, our book club live here that things will start to make sense for you, that you'll resonate with some things here and that that will help you greatly because what we're going to talk about at the end is all of the things that you can do according to Eckhart Tolle to move from the unconscious to the conscious and leave that past and stay present in this moment. Okay, so hold on. Hopefully this is really going to go. How um, Tolle sets up his book is that it's set up as him teaching. So him going around and having different um, lectures or different groups, whatever it was that he was doing as he was gathering all of the information for this book. And it's a series of people asking him questions and him giving the response to that. And so one of the people asked the question about, or, or really gave a statement more saying about a friend that she knows who is in an abusive relationship and that this isn't the first time that this person is in an abusive relationship and that she just doesn't understand why she would choose that. And he has a really amazing way of looking at this that I really, really resonate with because with the work that I do, of course, I do come across many people that have either gotten out of an abusive relationship and are scared that they're going to go back in to another one, right? Just keep repeating the pattern or people who have not quite left yet, right? And what he says it back is, would you choose unhappiness? If you did not choose it, how did it arise? What is its purpose? Who is keeping it alive? You say that you are conscious of your unhappy feelings, but the truth is that you are identified with them and keep the process alive through compulsive thinking. It is true that only an unconscious person will try to use or manipulate others. But it's also equally true that only an unconscious person can be used and manipulated. Your friend is stuck in a relationship with an abusive partner and not for the first time. Why? Not by choice. The mind, conditioned as it is by the past, always seeks to recreate what it knows and is familiar with. Even if it is painful, it is at least familiar. The mind always adheres to the known. The unknown is dangerous because it has no control over it. Nobody chooses dysfunction, conflict, pain. Nobody chooses insanity. They happen because there is not enough presence in you to dissolve the past, not enough light to dispel the darkness. You are not fully here. You have not quite woken up yet. In the meantime, the conditioned mind is running your life. And that to me is so powerful, so powerful. Because to me, I always do use that language that people are making a choice of what partner they want to date, for example. And it doesn't have to be an abusive partner, abusive relationships that they're repeating the pattern, but perhaps they're choosing people who are not really emotionally available to them or maybe not physically available to them. And I always use that word choose, but I don't necessarily mean that the person sits there and is scanning the room, be like, ooh, that person would be really good for me. Pass that person. Oh, I see dysfunction there. Going for it. That's not what I mean. When I say the word choose, I mean basically what is he, he is saying in that there's an energy that is happening there. It's like you can smell the dysfunction that's happening there. You can smell it, that it's going to allow you to repeat a pattern that you're so familiar and therefore so comfortable with that you will do it. And that part of the reason why you do it is because you enjoy the pain of the comfort zone that you are in. And I know that that sounds terrible, but the the enjoy part is the part that people usually can't relate to, right? They can't understand how would I enjoy the pain, but it's the comfort zone part that you need to focus on. That most times our comfort zone is a place where we talk negatively to ourselves. We put ourselves down. We feel like we can't do things, right? We're not smart enough. We're not pretty enough. We're not educated enough. We're not enough. 
whatever it is, suffering from imposter syndrome, always comparing ourselves to the elusive someone else, right? These types of things, that's our comfort zone. That's our place of safety. It's not because it's a lovely place to be. It's because it's a familiar place to be. And that familiar place feels safe. So he goes on to talk about um, the large, in large part, uh, their sense of self is intimately connected with your problems. That once this has happened, the last thing that we want is to become free of them because that would mean a loss of self. And I said that before, that that's exactly how I felt. I mean, I didn't realize that that's how I felt until, until I started moving through that. But now looking back on it, 100%, I had a huge amount of resistance that came up for me, that that resistance ends up looking like sabotage, right? Not following through on something, right? Having somebody that had awareness and, and could have been a spiritual guide, for example, and then allowing myself to lose touch with them rather than staying in their presence so that I could learn from them or whatever it was. And he says that this kind of psychological fear is always of something that might happen not of something that's happening right now. So you're physically here in the here and now while your mind has already gone to the future, thinking about what might happen, what will happen. How are you going to react when this happens? What are you going to say when that happens? Right? And he is saying that that creates an anxiety gap. He says literally stress is caused by being here but wanting to be there right? Not allowing ourselves to be really conscious. Enjoy the moment that we have right here. Instead, we're so busy saying things like, one day I'll make it. Like your goal is taking up so much of your attention that you reduce the present moment to just a means to an end. Is it taking the joy out of your doing? Are you waiting to start living? If you develop such a mind pattern, he says, no matter what you achieve or get, the present will never be good enough. The future will always seem like it's better. A perfect recipe for permanent dissatisfaction and non-fulfillment, he calls it. And he gives another example, right? How often are you, are you guilty of saying something like, when I obtain this or I'm free of that, then I will be okay or then I will be happy or you know, then I will be satisfied, whatever it is. And he says, this is the unconscious mindset that creates the illusion of salvation in the future. And he says that we're seeing time as the means to salvation, whereas the truth is the greatest, it's the greatest obstacle to salvation. Time is not salvation, right? Time is actually the greatest obstacle to us achieving or obtaining that salvation. He says another aspect of the emotional pain is that it's an intrinsic part of our egoic mind. It's a deep seated sense of lack or incompleteness of not being whole. And he says that when we complain, which obviously all of us do at some point or another, but when we complain, it's always non acceptance of what is right? It's an invariably it carries an unconscious negative charge. When you complain, you make yourself into a victim, right? You are resisting what is happening in your now. If you find your here and now intolerable, and it makes you unhappy, then he says there's three options, remove yourself from the situation, change it, or accept it totally. Now, he does give a little bit of the book to be able to explain because somebody that he was talking to when he made that statement was like, well, wait a second, that sounds like you're saying I should resign to the fact that, you know, this negative thing is happening to me. And he really goes on to explain, no, 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 acceptance is not the same as resignation, right? There's a big difference between accepting the now, accepting what is here and surrendering to it compared to resigning to something negative and saying, well, well, I guess this is happening. There's nothing I can do about it. There, of course, is always something you can do about it. And the first thing that you can do is to stop resisting it, right? Accepting it is the first step. And he says, 
A first thing to remember is this, as long as you make an identity of yourself out of the pain, you cannot become free of it. As long as part of your sense of self is invested in your emotional pain, you will unconsciously resist or sabotage every attempt that you make to heal that pain. I'm going to say that one again because I think this is really the biggest key for people who follow the work that I do. You resonate either with my story or the way that I'm trying to help people. So you may have come from an abusive background as well. And even if you haven't, we all have experienced pain in our lives. So we all know what it's like to have difficulty releasing that pain. All right, that pain might be the loss of a loved one, the loss of a relationship, right? It doesn't have to be abusive in nature. But whatever that is, I'm just going to repeat this again so that you really hear that. As long as you make an identity for yourself out of that pain, you cannot become free of it. As long as part of your sense of self is invested in your emotional pain, you will unconsciously resist or sabotage every attempt you make to heal that pain. And I know that this is true 100% for me. And I know that this is true for every single person I've ever worked with. Even the ones who have come to me absolutely adamant for help, there is always a moment in our work together where we can see that ego is popping up, where we can see that that, that fear the ego has of losing itself, losing its identity starts to come in. And it's different for every person. Sometimes they neglect to book their next appointment, for example, and I've got to, you know, follow through with them and catch up. Hey, you know, how's it going? You've, you've already got, you know, two or three sessions left. Let's get, you know, moving on this. Or they're in my, um, my three-month uh, Survivor to Warrior program, for example, and they're partway through and they've been working miracles with all the tasks. And then all of a sudden we jump on our next coaching call one that we have every week and they haven't done anything, right? And they start, of course, life gets busy. Of course, you know, stuff happens. But you make time for things that are important. And of course, you are important. You should be the priority. And so while I understand that sometimes the whole task doesn't get done, when I see somebody that has been making that time week in and week out and then all of a sudden has not found time to do any of that assignment, right? That's a big warning sign for me that ego has popped up. They have now started to resist or sabotage their very attempt for healing their pain. And we need to address this instead of just pushing through or we won't get anywhere. They'll continue the sabotage. So to suddenly see that you are or you have been attached to your pain. I mean, I remember when I first had this aha moment, it was not pretty. It was not pleasant. It, it can be quite shocking of a realization, right? I mean, why would you want to do that to yourself when you realize that? I mean, for me, I had, you know, carried suicidal thoughts. I really, really felt at my core that I was ugly, stupid, worthless, useless. I mean, it affected every aspect of my life. And to realize that I was doing that to myself, that I was the one that was responsible because I couldn't let go of that pain. I had identified with it. I didn't know who I was without it. That nearly rocked my boat and it, so much so that it nearly crashed and sank. But here's the thing that Tole says is the moment that you realize this, you've broken the attachment. And that's exactly what happened for me. Of course, in that moment, I was absolutely shocked. That followed up with some shame and guilt, right? Real feeling, strong feelings that came out. How could I have done this to myself? And without any further work whatsoever, without me having to explore any of that, it just whoosh, vanished. 
right? Suddenly that shame wasn't there. That guilt wasn't there. It was just an overarching feeling of I've made it. It doesn't matter why it took me so long. Here I am. And it was literally like I had peeled a layer away from something that was holding my soul down. It was absolutely incredible. So as difficult as it might be to hear me say that or read Tolle's words in his book, you really truly listening and having that aha moment and having the realization for yourself is in itself the fix, right? It is incredibly powerful. So basically, the, the book is all about needing to achieve the consciousness, the conscious state, right? Being aware of the fact that the unconscious is kind of ruling the show, that, um, that the ego is at play, that ego is always invested in strife and power struggles and, you know, all kinds of, you know, it's the part of us that wants to gossip and wants there to be drama and all that kind of stuff. And so it's about shifting out of that to a place of consciousness where we are aware of what's happening. And while there still might be drama in our lives, it, we just don't allow it to affect us because we're conscious of it. That awareness eliminates its effect on us. So he says that to the ego, the present moment hardly exists. It's all wrapped up in the past and in the future, like I said before, and they're considered to the ego to be the most important, right? We're gearing up for the future. And I am very guilty of doing this as well. And I'll catch myself still to this day doing this from time to time. If I know that I'm going to be facing something that could be a bit difficult, you know, it's a, it has that air of the unknown. It involves somebody else. So I don't know how they will react. You know, I'll catch myself going through kind of repeating or kind of practicing the script of how it is that I want to sound. How do I want to come off? What's the energy that I want to give? What's the best way for me to say what I have to say so that they are not upset or that they don't take it the wrong way or, or that type of thing, right? And I'll catch myself doing that and being like, Lisa, there is no way, there's no amount of practicing the other person is going to hear what they want to hear and what they need to hear based on their view of the world. And it doesn't matter how you present it, right? If they are going to react negatively, they're going to react negatively. You have to have faith in your own ability to handle that in that situation. Because sitting here and spending all of that energy to come up with every response that I could possibly have to every single scenario that could unfold is quite frankly exhausting and worthless because that one thing, that one way they could end up um, reacting is maybe the one way that I didn't think of in the end, right? It doesn't help me in any way, shape or form. Oh, and Danny has chimed in. This is my publisher. I love this book, Change My Life at 19. Yes. And Sarah also says, uh, me too, read it at 19. Oh, amazing, ladies. Thank you so much for chiming in. I just absolutely adore this book. Um, so we're talking here about our present rather than allowing our ego to be focused on the past or on the future. And he says, Tolle says that this total reversal of the truth accounts for the fact that in the ego mode, the mind is so dysfunctional, right? We are blocking ourselves from our true power and from true happiness by doing all the very things we've got ourselves convinced will actually bring us happiness in essence, right? So he's saying that we see and we judge the present through eyes of the past. And that gets totally distorted. Our view of the present ends up getting totally distorted because it's through eyes of the past. We're not, our ego isn't allowing us to just look at the situation as it is. We bring in all of our other drama from the past in order to help us understand what's happening now. All right. And really, really 
uh, powerful and how that ends up affecting us. And I can relate to this with the work that I do with NLP, right? That's essentially all the work that I do is in tackling these different beliefs that we've gathered from our whole existence up until now and using these techniques, including just communication, including getting people to just start shifting the way that they're looking at something so that their now is not affected by their past anymore or about a future that doesn't exist anymore. So Roz says, I had a read of it too. Good presentation, Lisa. Thank you, Roz. Appreciate that. So Eckhart Tolle goes on to say that thinking and consciousness are not synonymous words here. Thinking is only a small aspect of consciousness. Thought cannot exist without consciousness, but consciousness does not need thought. We can be aware without having to think about being aware, essentially. And he says that basically the power of now is none other than the power of your presence, your consciousness liberated from thought forms. So all of his steps, the how, okay, so now we're aware that we're doing these things. We're aware that the unconscious mind or the ego state is really driving us here, that we're so stuck in the past or in a future that hasn't happened yet, that it's affecting our ability to actually see straight when we're looking at the now, the present. So what do we do about it? So the whole rest of this is going to be all of Eckhart Tolle's um, examples or suggestions of what it is that we should do. So how do we move towards consciousness? He says, basically, the moment you start watching the thinker, right? So the moment that you actually step back and start noticing what it is that you're saying to yourself, what it is that you're thinking about, right? How often you're actually thinking about something in the future or thinking about something in the past. Oh, I wish I would have said that differently. Oh, darn it. If that would have happened, then maybe this would, all that kind of stuff. The moment that you start watching the thinker, a higher level of consciousness becomes activated. You then begin to realize that there is a vast realm of intelligence beyond thought, that thought is only a tiny aspect of that intelligence. You also realize that all the things that truly matter, beauty, love, creativity, joy, inner peace, arise from beyond the mind. You begin to awaken. So really, it's the same as what we were saying before. When you realize that you are attached to your pain, that you've identified with it, that very act of having that realization allows you to break the attachment. And here, that very act of just catching yourself and noticing what it is that you're thinking and what actually is happening here, that is enough to start actually raising your vibration to a higher level. He says, as you listen to the thought, you feel a conscious presence, your deeper self, behind or underneath the thought, as it were. And the thought then loses its power over you, right? You quickly subside that whole power that it has. And because you are no longer energizing the mind through identification with it, you can just let it go, right? This is the beginning of the end of involuntary and compulsive thinking it says the single most vital step on your journey toward enlightenment is this learn to disidentify from your mind every time you create a gap in the stream of mind the light of your consciousness grows stronger observe the many ways in which unease discontent and tension arise within you through unnecessary judgment, resistance to what is, and denial of the now. And I've talked about judgment before, not necessarily in book club lives, but in other Facebook lives I've done, where, you know, there's a lot of people that talk about how judgment of other people is really a judgment of yourself, right? That we're holding the mirror up to ourselves and we're either jealous of something that somebody else has that we don't think we're capable of attaining, or we've noticed a trait in somebody else that's really triggered a nerve with us because deep down inside, we either fear or we know that we also have that trait, whatever it is that we're judging. 
So that word judging for me really comes up because that's actually something that I am working on for 2020, right, is releasing my need to judge myself. So that really, really rang true for me. Um, I am at ease at this moment. That's what he is suggesting that we say to ourselves or ask to ourselves, right? So when we start noticing that discontent or noticing that that feeling of lack, that feeling of unfulfillment or whatever it is that we are noticing, ask yourself, am I at ease at this moment? Or you can ask, what's going on inside me at this moment? And be at least as interested at what goes on inside you as what happens outside of you. And your life situation may be full of problems because most life situations are, but find out if you have any problem at this moment, right? At this very moment, not tomorrow or in 10 minutes, but right now, do you have a problem right now? Or was it actually a problem that you had five minutes ago or a problem that you might have tomorrow, right? Right now, do you have that problem? And he's saying that when we are starting on this path of moving from unconscious to conscious, we will have a shift at some point where one day you might catch yourself smiling at the voice that's in your head, just like you would smile at the antics of a child. And that's your cue. That means that you no longer take the content of your mind all that seriously, as your sense of self does not depend on it. And I can really attest to that, right? My mantra that played billions of times a day, every single day as a teen um, was, I am stupid, ugly, worthless, useless. Nobody's ever going to love me and I'm never going to amount to anything. Until one day when I was sitting in a bus going somewhere, I can't even remember, listening to music. And I started that mantra. I don't remember what was going on, what my life situation was at that particular time. But whatever it was, was causing me to think, oh, yeah, I'm not going to be good enough for whatever this scenario was. And I started to try to pull my mantra in to show myself just how out of my depth I was, right? That I belonged way down low on the pile rather than allowing myself to succeed. And I couldn't. It was instantaneous, just like that, I had a tremendous moment of shift where I literally felt like the my grandmother who had just passed, I felt like her spirit was there and slapped me in the face and said, no more. And from that moment, I've never been able to pull up that mantra without smiling, just like I'm, I would smile at the antics of a child, right? I can see the pattern unfold. It's like I can detach from the situation and I can see all of the variables that happened to get me in that point. I can see like it is absolutely crystal clear, so obvious. Ah, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of the unknown or I'm afraid of success or I'm, you know, whatever it is that's driving me to need to pull myself back into that comfort zone, right? And then start to realize that comfort zone isn't very comfortable anymore. And when I think about that being my comfort zone, it also makes me smile like I would smile at the antics of a child. And it literally was like that. Right? So really seriously can happen. Okay? He says, realize deeply that the present moment is all you ever have. Make the now the primary focus of your life. The secret of life is to die before you die and find that there is no death. So what he's referring to there is from, from fact, you know, his fact that we've got a higher energy, that we are all connected, that we are not separate people walking around. We are not separate from all the other animals on the earth. We are not separate from the plants. We are not separate from the oceans or separate from the stars or separate from the universe or any of the other planets or solar systems. We are all one, that we are one energy, the source, as he refers to it. And so, yes, our body is going to die. 
And when that happens, we will lose our ego and we will lose our personality. Those two things will die, but we will not. Those are the two things that we adopted in this life and they are not going to go with us. We will realize that we are immortal, essentially, at our core. And he brings up those um, near-death experiences that a lot of people have had where they see that light or, you know, whatever they end up describing. And, and then they decide to they're not going to die or, or whatever ends up happening there. They end up being saved. And they all have very, very similar stories, don't they? And so that's what he's referring to here. He said, die before you die, right? Have that moment where you realize that there is no death, that we are all one, right? And it's not to say that the body is inconsequential because his next thing that he goes on to talk about is that transformation is actually through the body, not away from it. So he mentions about how many spiritual students in the past have attempted to reach enlightenment through denying the body, through things like fasting, for example. Um, but what he is saying is that for us to reach true enlightenment, we actually have to transform through the body. We have to become more at peace and at one with the body. To really inhabit the a body is to feel it from within, to feel the life force that we have inside the body and thereby come to know that you are beyond the outer form. But that is only the beginning of the inward journey that will take you ever more deeply into a realm of great stillness and peace, yet also of great power and vibrant life. He says what the key is, is for us to be able to connect to that inner body and stay there, right? So a permanent connectedness, right? To feel it at all times. And he says that being able to do this will rapidly deepen and transform our lives. The more consciousness you direct into the inner body, the higher the vibrational frequency becomes. And if you keep your attention in the body as much as possible, you will be anchored in the now. You won't lose yourself in the external world and you won't lose yourself in your mind. Thoughts and emotions, fears and desires, they all will still be there to some extent, but they won't take you over. And the last thing that he talks about is surrender, surrendering to the resistance that comes up to this, right? And he says, he goes back to accepting what is in this moment. And when you accept what is, so every moment, so you could say, you know, you accept that this video is the best and the next video that you'll be watching is the best, right? That This chair is the best. The morsel of food that you're going to put in your mouth is the best. When you are able to accept what is in this moment, that is enlightenment. And he says that surrender is simple but profound wisdom of yielding rather than opposing the flow of life. So again, it's not about you know, having to resign yourself that something's happened. So, oh, well, I guess I'm just going to have to, you know, not eat today because I don't have any food in my cupboard. I'm accepting what is. That is different from surrender, right? The wisdom of yielding rather than opposing the flow of life. You can still go about making change. You're just accepting that this is what is happening rather than resisting it and causing more strife. He says you cannot be conscious and unhappy. Those two things don't go together. Conscious and negative don't go together. Negativity, unhappiness, or suffering in whatever form means that there is resistance, and resistance is always unconscious. And so that goes back to him talking about the ability to step back and notice your thoughts right? When you start to realize that you are unhappy, even if it's just in a moment, right? He is saying that that moment, we need to regain our consciousness, regain our awareness in that moment by analyzing, right? What, what has made us unhappy here? 
bringing it to the conscious so that we can actually have positivity and happiness. And he says, start by acknowledging that there is the resistance, right? Acknowledge it. It's there. You don't have to resist it. Resist the resistance, right? Accept it. Accept what is. The resistance is there. And that's okay. Be there when it happens, when the resistance arises. Observe how your mind creates it, how it labels the situation, how it labels you or others. Look at the thought process involved. Feel the energy of the emotion. By witnessing the resistance, you will see that it serves no purpose. Right? And I'd go on to say that you will likely see that it is, again, something from the past or something from the future, from not being in the now and accepting this moment, what is happening right here and now. And the last question that one of his students asked him is, and I think the answer is profound, and this is how the book actually ends. <laughs> the student says, how will I know when I have surrendered? And Eckhart Tolle says, when you no longer need to ask the question. <laughs> I think that's so beautiful. Now, surrender is something that I really, really believe in, and I have for a few decades now, surrender has been something that has really affected me in an incredibly positive way. And I think surrender in all cases is really the lifeblood of being able to move forward. And surrender, just like what Tole is saying, surrender does not mean that you have to resign to what's happening. You know, if you are in an abusive relationship for something, or for some example, that doesn't mean that you are resigning that this is your fate and this is what you're going to stay in. Or if you're feeling so much pain from something that happened in the past, that doesn't mean that you're resigning yourself to, well, this is what my life is going to be like. I'm saying, and I think Tole is saying, that that's what you have been doing all along, which is why you are unhappy, which is why you are having the pain. You've resigned yourself to this being you. You've identified with that pain, and you don't know who you are without it. And surrendering to the universe, surrendering the need to control surrendering whatever it is, the resistance to taking the next step forward, right? Those of you that are watching this right now that maybe read the book or maybe you you haven't read the book, you know, you're, re you're watching all of this and you're resonating with it. And if you're having some aha moments for yourself, pay attention to what you choose to do with that, right? And again, this idea of choice doesn't mean that you're going to sit back and you're going to make a conscious decision to not do something versus to do something. It means that if you are going to stay unconscious, despite the revelations that you have had right now, then you will choose to make excuses for yourself to not move forward, right? You will choose to sabotage yourself. So you might be making excellent progress up until now. And all of a sudden, you forget to do what has been working for you for months and all of a sudden you just you just don't do it you get out of the habit of doing it or you know that you've got something like this book club right something that could kind of hold you accountable and say ah oh, you've got six or seven weeks to read this next self-help book and and whatnot whatever completely free i've got a 30-day challenge completely free whatever it is right that you've got in front of you maybe you've got somebody that you know is a huge inspiration, that they could help you on your journey and you're allowing yourself to walk away from them rather than build that relationship with them. Whatever it is, notice that that is what you're doing and then start looking at that to say, why am I at ease in this moment? Am I resisting the fact that I could actually get help that I could actually create the life of my dreams. What am I resisting this for? Is it the fear of the unknown? Is it the fear of losing yourself, losing your identity, because it's so wrapped up in that pain? Are you truly ready 
to let that go? Are you truly ready to live in the right here and right now, not in the past and not in the future? Are you ready to become conscious? <laughs> Asking yourself those questions actually brings you into consciousness. It brings you into heightened awareness. And it shifts something in you that you'll never be able to describe to anybody. I still can't describe that moment on the bus perfectly for anybody else to be able to understand who hasn't had the moment themselves, right? You'll have that same moment, that same effect. And the choice, quote unquote, isn't of whether or not you're going to take the step. The choice is on whether or not you're going to allow yourself to become conscious. So I've given you, and Tole has given you, all kinds of things for you to start doing. And the main thing is taking that step back and actually watching, watching your thoughts, watching your actions and reactions, watching your emotions, watching who do you resonate with? Who are you if not about your past? Right? Are you wrapped up, is your identity wrapped up in that pain? Asking yourself those questions and watching how you actually unfold is the first step and the most prominent step. Everything unfolds from there. It truly is remarkable. So I thank you so much for watching and being part of our book club today. Um, Sarah says to live in the body instead of the mind is something I've learned through Tai Chi. Yes, Sarah, thank you. There are loads of different ways to do this. And Eckhart, he does actually explain in a lot more detail, obviously, than what I did about going within. And he actually walks you through a little something. Um, but I do have a few meditations that if you are interested, anybody watching, either live on the replay, that you are interested in being able to feel that energy of yours in your body. I have several different meditations that are in my YouTube meditations playlist. And one of them is actually a surrender control. Um, so that is, is obviously very fitting. So I'll go back into the description of this and I will edit it to add my YouTube channel in there for you, which of course is free for you to subscribe. And you can have a look at all of those videos that are in there, whether it's videos or meditation videos, you know, any of them or all of them may have a profound effect in helping you to do all of these things. So you're welcome to that. I did allude to my 30 day challenge. That is something that you can start at any time. This book club is something that you can start at any time, right? There's lots of different things that I offer. If you are a survivor of abuse and trauma, I do have a free Facebook group as well. That is a closed private group so that only members of the group can see your posts or your comments, so it makes it a safe space. I've got lots of different things, lots of options for you uh, all along the scale financially. So wherever you are at, both on your healing journey and also with your finances, you can find the help that you need and you deserve to have. It's just a matter of whether you're going to allow yourself to be conscious enough to accept that help. So go on over to lifelikeyoumeanup.com and you can see any of what I've talked about there. I'll also include the link for the book club is in the description now. I'll go in and edit that and include the link for YouTube. And I will let you know now that our next book we're going to look at is The Secret, which is a an amazingly profound book. And how could I do a book club and not do The Secret? So that is going to be our next book coming out. So go ahead and join the book club, which I've included the link for, and you will get uh, an email and let you know exactly when the date for the secret will be a link to purchase the book if you don't have it already. And of course, I will be downloading this video and sending that off to you in an email as well. So you can watch this as many times as you like. Thank you so much book clubbers. And I will see you in seven weeks time. Bless.